Courtesans, coquettes, and coveted desires, Paris was dubbed the brothel of Europe in the late 19th century for a reason. Brothels were at their peak in the latter half of the 19th century, with around 200 legalized brothels and maisons in the city. For centuries, French kings and aristocrats had kept courtesans and mistresses, but the business really became booming when the Palace of Versailles was constructed by the Sun King and it was used as a house of pleasure by him and his descendants until the French Revolution happened. What was it like to be a kept woman in Paris? How tough was it for a madam to run a brothel? How did brothels play a part in the formation of the Vice Police Department? Today, we learn it all. The nutty history about the filthy secrets of brothels during the Age of Versailles. There was a time when nuns and coquettes lived together harmoniously in convents like dwellings of Paris and during the Middle Ages nonetheless. But when the wife of King Philip II found out that the nicely dressed young woman she hugged during the sign of peace in the church was a courtesan, Philip forbade women of brothel work from wearing coats and ordered them to wear golden belts as a symbol of their profession. He also decreed that a brothel should be located at least 300 meters from a church. And if you're thinking, well, that's not too far, it was because Philip was considerate to make repenting easier for clients after visiting a brothel. Philip II was the first king to regulate brothels in Paris, but Louis IX removed them altogether from Paris and forced them outside the city walls. This is how brothels came to be known as bordels, or being located at the borders of the city, and thus the word brothel originated. These establishments were also required to put up a red lantern outside the door as a sign of their work, and thus the concept of the red light district was born. When the Sun King took over the renovation of the hunting lodge built by his father, it was evident brothels and monarchy would reconcile again. Henri IV was already infamous for having many mistresses, but his grandson, Louis XIV, developed the estate that became the future seat of power of France as well as turning it into his Garden of Desires. The great Sun King had so many mistresses, it's kind of hard to name them all. There are well-known lovers like Marquise de Montespan, Louise de la Vallière, Marie Angelique de Scorai and Marie Mancini, but the list is long, very long. Before Louis XIV moved on to young noble women, he practiced his arts in the various palaces, serving maids, and he fathered a child with a gardener girl. Far from causing a scandal, the court was quite pleased with this, for it proved that Louis was able to father children, a thing of utmost importance for France. But the Sun King was also a major believer in rules are for thee, not for me. The shadow of the powerful semi-secret organization of the French Counter-Reformation, the Company of the Holy Sacrament, was long on the Sun King's earlier rule. Before his ascension, they tried to pull a stint of moral reform by imprisoning vagabonds, reforming brothel workers, and preaching about a brand of ascetic piety deftly satirized in Tartuffe, also known as the Impostor. During his rule, Louis XIV tried to crack down on the spreading of common brothels in Paris while building an exclusive establishment for himself in Versailles. One of the reasons behind this repression was the emergence of venereal disease in Naples in 1494, which soon became a problem in France as well. In 1658, he ordered all women guilty of solicitation, copulation, or adultery to be imprisoned in the Pité Salpêtrière until the priest or religious officials said they had repented and changed. In 1667, he also assigned the task of surveying public girls to the lieutenant general of the police, which led to the establishment of the vice department. The surveillance and crackdown on the profession of public girls weren't only done for the sake of morality and law, but also in the hope to develop a better understanding of how much brothels were contributing to the French economy. They were also studying how the economy of brothels functioned. There were vast amounts of dossiers of information on the city's brothels and patrons, but they hardly utilized that information for anything fruitful. To this day, it remains a mystery why the Parisian police spent so much time and effort observing an underground economy it apparently had no interest in curtailing. However, these dossiers do paint a vivid picture of what was going on behind the sheen curtains of the Parisian brothels. While the common police were left handling street solicitation in common brothels, a particular vice unit called Demimonde was created to monitor the world of elite courtesans of Paris and Versailles, as they were an actual vulnerability for the French government. Common coquettes could be apprehended and dealt with any time by trying them in mass and having their heads shaven and thrown into Paris's famous women's prison, La Salpêtrière. But the matter of elite courtesans was different. There was a certain number of elite brothels that catered to male nobility and authorities that were considered legal. 
The demimon not only conducted surveillance on such brothels, but also made sure the madam running the brothel abided by the strict rules, as well as supplied the inspectors in charge of handling them with a steady stream of information about their patrons. So in a way, madams were both domestic spies and informants at the same time. But most of the unit's resources were spent watching a particular group of elite courtesans that worked as professional mistresses. Called dames entre tenu, or kept women, these women provided intimacy, company, and sometimes even love for elite men in exchange for being kept. Kept here means being financially supported so they could establish and maintain a household. La galantry, the practice of being or keeping a mistress, was not illegal, even while brothels were. Kept women had oral contracts with their patrons, which postulated how much the mistress would be remunerated each month and whether the patron would set his mistress up in an apartment, buy her new furnishings, pay her bills, and give her gifts. The mistress's duties were not delineated, but rather were understood, leaving a great deal of room for misunderstanding. The vice department that operated between 1747 to 1771 gathered every bit of biographical and financial data on the men who hired kept women. In a way, brothels inspired the system and techniques that are now used by counterintelligence organizations all over the world. But there is still a burning question. Why was this massive surveillance conducted? One of the most prominent theories is that they were meant for bedtime reading for King Louis XV and his mistress Marquis de Pompadour, who had been the protector of the police lieutenant general most responsible for establishing the unit in the first place. These reports, rumors, and gossip were used by the king and his mistress to enliven their reputedly fainted intimacy. However, there is a strong argument against this theory that often these reports contain rumors and gossiping against the king himself that would have only soured his mood. When Justine Paris and Marguerite Gordon met in the Bicitre Hospital and decided to create the most famous brothel in 18th century Paris, they were both already quite successful as madams. Marguerite was a coquette herself when she was new in Paris after her marriage to a French soldier. With her husband's permission, she had taken a noble patron with whom she bore a child and earned a large amount of stipend. But when the generous nobleman died in 1759, she knew she had to make money from the money she had saved. She opened her first brothel and later separated from her spouse in 1765. During the next eight years, she crafted a network of procurers, not only in the capital but in the provinces as well. Her staff was divided into four classes of coquettes, one who worked in her brothel, a second class who had their own homes and visited their clients, a third made of artists who merely supplied their normal income with solicitation, and a fourth made up by the spouses of rich men who wished to earn their own money. Industrious Marguerite didn't hold any reservations. She was as eager to supply services to people asking for the same gender as much as opposite genders. She also had her own line of toys and tools, as well as offered rooms in her brothels to couples who needed privacy because of the taboo nature of their relationship. When she met beautiful, witty, and infamously debauched Justine Perry as they were both being treated for venereal diseases, it was a match made in heaven. They established a temple of Venus with an antique shop as its front next to a rich and ancient hotel owned by Charles Francois Boud, which legitimized their shop further. This brothel soon became the hottest spot in town. However, within the first year of the establishment, Justine Paddy passed and Gordon decided to run the place all by herself. Gordon enacted 20 articles that the residents must adhere to. In addition, she wrote a set of instructions for a young lady who wants to make a fortune with the charms she has received from nature. Among Gordon's clients were royalty, the nobility, academics, and clergymen. Casanova, a close friend of Justine Paddy, was also a frequent visitor and wrote his famous memoirs in this brothel. Rue Dusbo wasn't only known for its best women, but also for its fine dine and wine. To save her women from dreaded government-run hospitals that were less focused on treating venereal disease and more on treating women themselves, Gordon bought a villa at viers le bel where she sent her sick or pregnant coquettes. It was known by the locals as the convent. However, after the French Revolution, things changed. The new regime wanted brothels to be regulated and not outlawed, and that ushered in a new era for the industry. But Gordon didn't live that long to see it. But maybe we could cover that era in another video. Tell us in the comments if you want to follow up. And as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.